Good morning to everyone and welcome to a very special moment for us as the NSCF, the hub and the network. It is our very first webinar for the uh, NSCF collection management course and for the manual implementation. We are so excited about this and we hope you are as excited as we are. Now, I want you to show me some reactions, how happy you are, how excited you are. If you can go to the um, reaction button and choose the reaction you want, you can choose a love, a clap, whatever you want. Let me see some reactions, please. Let me see some reactions. I see some hands up. <laughs> so I guess that's your reaction. Oh, you don't have a reaction button. Sorry about that. So we can skip that. I'm just going to assume that you are excited, right? All right, so I'm going to, um, to introduce some of the panelists that are going to run um, at this webinar. It's um, Michelle Hamer, who is the NSCF lead. There she waves. <laughs> then we have Chanel Ribeiro, who is the NSCF project manager. She waves. And then Audrey Dava, who is the NSCF collections management coordinator. She gives us some love. <laughs> Thank you, panelists. We are so excited to um, get to see what's up for us to learn. I just want to also acknowledge the participants or the um, uh, course participants, those who have registered for the course. Um, we are so glad you registered, you are willing to learn and to um, work towards your career as, um, as you improve your career. Um, let's go to the next slide. Now, before we get started with the webinar, we need to go through some guidelines of engagement. So some rules of engagement. Please keep your contributions helpful and considerate of the host and other participants. So nothing negative, nothing rude. Let's be kind to one another. Use the chat box to say hello and where you are coming from, your institution. Um, I see some people have already started. So for example, you say, hi, this is Furu from the NSCF Hub. And that's it. So just let us know that you're here. You can use the Q&A box to add some questions that you might have during the webinar. We're going to try to answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. But if we don't get to them, we'll make sure that we answer them to the recording or the webinar link. And just to note that um, we have set up a page on the NSCF website. That's the link. If you can go to nscf.org.za, go to resources and then to collections management you'll find on all information that you may need with regards to the course as well as manual implementation and if you don't have a copy of the manual you can get and down, download the soft copy there next slide just to go through some outline of the webinar we're going to cover what is ethics? So defining it and uh, finding out what it actually is. Then collecting and other forms of acquiring specimens. Then collections as irreplaceable and invaluable assets. Collection ownership, who actually owns collections. Access to collections and data. Research and use of collections. Conflict of interest. Social justice and decolonization. And then we'll end with a call to action, um, the ethics policy. Just a note, ICOM, the ICOM code of ethics for natural history collections was used for manual guidelines, um, but also several other sources were used 
um, in the in the manual topics. Next slide. So um, before we get to the next slide, <laughs> um, Michelle is going to take us through the uh, actual content of the webinar. So let's um, go to Michelle Hema. Okay, thanks Fulu. So I'm just going to start and then other people will take over from me. But I think the first question obviously is what is ethics? Um, it's not a very uh, clear and it's not always a very easy to understand concept. The definition that we've used in the manual is that it's the moral principles, moral principles that govern an individual's behavior or conducting an, of an activity. Even that may be a little bit difficult to understand. And often people say, well, what's the difference between unethical behavior and criminal behavior? I didn't break a law, so it's fine. So breaking a law is always unethical, but you can do, be unethical and not have broken any laws. So it's a little bit more difficult to, to Put, put it down, you know, to always say, yes, that was unethical or no, it wasn't. So that picture in the corner there, values, honors, honor, conscience, responsibility, fairness, right, honesty, principles, and morals. So those are all sort of words that are linked to ethics. So if you think about it, what are some unethical behaviors that are common in the workplace? So you've heard about them, you may have seen them, you may have even done some of them. But what do you give us one example in the chat box? So let's see those. You can just keep it very brief. Let's see if people what they think about ethics, unethical behavior in the workplace. Can I ask if you post, please make sure that you click the box on top that says um, all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, everyone can't see your, if you say all panelists, then the other attendees can't see what you've written. Thank you. Thanks, Chanel. Anything coming through? I can't see any collecting specimens not listed on a permit. Stealing time. Let's keep them going. Stealing IP. So intellectual property, yes. Refusing or limiting access to data or specimens, giving your friends first preference. Yes, Cindy, yeah. So there are quite a lot of different examples. Being inconsiderate, um, plagiarism, approving crony tenders, are oh, big ones, honey. <laughs> So in the whole world of SEM and tenders, unethical behavior is, is yeah. inequality, yes, not referencing and acknowledging other people's work. So lots, there are lots of um, examples. Uh, let's move on. So you can keep them going. People can still read them. Let's go to the next one, being unfair, Mzwai. Next slide, Chanel. doing your own business during working hours. Okay, so now we're going to, to, to do a test. It's often difficult to define what is unethical or ethical. So I sometimes, uh, you'd have to weigh up things. So let's do a poll now. So these five scenarios and uh, Fulu or Chanel will put up the poll and you can vote if you think each one is ethical or unethical. So you just click there and then you say submit and we'll do it, take a poll. So the first one is you give your unemployed cousin a part-time job in your office to help her out. She's unemployed, she's struggling, ethical or unethical. You sell homemade biscuits to the staff you supervise to raise funds for your son's soccer tour. 
You take cake left over from the office Christmas party for the homeless person you always see at the robot on your way home. You ask your staff to <laughs> put a different date onto the performance assessments. Um, you download that amazing movie about the octopus. So surely that's related to my work during your lunch hour and you'll watch it afterwards. You won't steal time. Right, so you can start vote, voting. I can't vote, but you can all start voting and submit and you'll wait for those all to come in. People are obviously struggling to figure out, is this really unethical? I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it seems like seems like most people have voted. Okay, I'll just all right. Them in that. Okay, let me end the poll. Yeah, let's end it and let's have a look. Okay, interesting. So most people think giving your relative a job in your office is unethical. It's pretty split about selling homemade biscuits. <laughs> the staff you supervise. <laughs> but think about those staff you supervise. You go to them and you say, I've got, I'm selling these biscuits. And they feel like they have to say, oh, okay, I'll buy them from you, even if they don't want to. It's almost exactly split. Um, oh, so that was that one, yeah. Amazing that it's almost exactly split. Okay. People think that it's, it's completely ethical to take leftover cake, give it to the homeless person, yeah. Wow, for the asking staff to sign their performance documents and put an earlier date. Nearly everybody thinks it's unethical, interesting. And then downloading an amazing movie about an octopus during your lunch break. So it's almost, again, an exact split. So that would really depend whether you're using your own data or the um, institution's um, network to do that. So if you're using your institution's network, it is actually unethical. So, so interesting, can you see how it's not always a cut and dried thing. Not everybody knows. We all know that this is, we know when it's something's a law, but when it's an ethical decision, it's not always that clear across people. And that's what makes it so difficult. So that was very interesting. Thanks for participating in that. That uh, just shows how difficult this topic is. Okay, next slide. And Pulu gave you the outline of the webinar today, and you'll see it covers all different aspects of collections. So where do you get your material from? How do you look after it? How do you provide access to it? How do you use it for research? So all of those things, ethics affects every single one of those steps. And that's why we put this topic of ethics first. So although it's chapter nine, I think, Chapter nine in the manual, ethics kind of overarches across all different elements. And that's why we decided it has to come first. So collecting material, I think most people do know that, that there are ethical issues, that you must have permits, it's the legal requirement, um, and the way you collect things should be ethical. Uh, and that you must have minimum impact on the long-term survival of a population and cause the least harm to the environment. So even if you've got your permit, how many individuals are you collecting and um, what impact will that have? And I just put two examples of little animals here. That one, um, I'm hoping there's no diptera specialist because I think it's a tabana, but anyway, a long tongue fly. These are very specialist pollinators of, of flowers. And the pollination biologists have been back to the same place repeatedly and collected and collected and collected because they need large sample sizes to do their stats. And, the, and their stories now about populations having been completely over-collected and wiped out. 
And then the little bush baby on the side, I just think, I think things have changed a lot. But if you look at a lot of old collections, you might see that there were sort of 40, 50 of the same species of these little animals collected at the same place over a period of like three days. So somebody went in there with a gun and shot everything repeatedly. So, yeah, you've got to think about that very carefully. Then birds or mammals, we know that there's welfare, there's ethics requirements, um, but other organisms also need ethics approval. So it's not only when you work with birds and mammals. You also need to think about what materials you're using. Could they cause damage to non-target organisms? So if you're using ethylene, ethyl glycol or whatever in your pitfall traps, um, the impact of trampling, digging in traps, clearing bush, removing a fossil, all of that might impact on the environment. And then what happens to your bycatch? And then, and what will you do with waste chemicals when you're in the field? Do you just throw out your poisons from the pitfall traps? Do you just throw out the poison from your malaise trap? Where do you put waste alcohol? All of those things, right? I think that that's it for me. Next one. Yeah, and then things that people don't really think about that much, but it's it's very, very important. So it's also about ethics. Are you working on communal land, so travel land, communally owned land? Have you asked permission from the right person? So have you found out who's the chief? Can I go and speak to them? Can I get permission? Even though I've got a permit or I don't need a permit, uh, you should get um, approval. And then are you working with the local people in your work? So are you involving them in some way? So it's very easy to just go into an area where people live, completely ignore them, do your thing, drive out, and just think how you would feel if, if people behave like that on your property. And then if you're working in another country and bringing material back into South Africa, what is the benefit to that country of allowing you to do that? So this has also become increasingly important. So there's legislation, sure, that governs it, but it's more about just being ethical about it. All right, so I think at that point, I'm gonna hand over to Audrey. All right, thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Michelle. So, the material that we receive must have been obtained in a legal and ethical way. So are we going to accept material even when we know it was legally, illegally acquired? And as the poll has clearly shown us, it's not always a clear cut when we make these decisions. And permit issuing authorities uh, and funding agencies in the scientific journals are now requiring ethical clearance for projects before issuing um, a collecting permit or awarding funding. So it's important to have such approval and it's important to have the documentation in place. And if the material is a donation, it is up to us to request for the paper that should accompany the donation from the person who is donating the material. At the moment, there are lots of questions about the donated materials uh, that don't have the Section 20 of the Animal Disease Act of 1984. Um, the collecting permits, the import permits, and all the relevant paperwork that is listed in the manual that we'll go through when we do the next uh, webinar, which will be the documentation. So we need to have all this in place. And what do we do if someone is coming to us to donate material that is possibly stolen? Do we accept the material because it's too nice to pass, because it's too rare to not have in our collection? And also, if we are going to accept material, whether we go out to the field ourselves or it's a donation, is the institution able to care for those specimens that are being donated or that we are going out to acquire? Do we have sufficient resources in terms of the staff to curate the material, the storage space to keep the collection, the time and the preservatives, all the, the 
resources that will be required for one to take care of that acquired material? Or do we just keep collecting and we let it lie unaccessioned and inaccessible for years? And is that an ethical thing to do? It clearly is not from where I'm standing. So it's important for us to make decisions Either we inform the authorities of the issues that the process of obtaining permits are not working because of one, two, three, and we try to influence the change. And you also still have to take decisions like, do you refuse the donation? Do you recommend it to another institution who can deal with it so that it's not your problem? Or do you accept it and you are prepared to deal with whatever consequences are coming? And like I have said, it's not always easy to make those judgments. Uh, so one should think about how that decision will affect them and the institution. Would you be able to explain yourself in court if you had accepted a donation that was illegally or unethically acquired? Would you be able to explain yourself to your family if you suddenly find yourself let go from work because you did something you were not supposed to do. So all these questions that I have put out here, along with all the other ethical issues that you have raised in the chat box or that you are still going to think of as we go with the webinar, they should be discussed, debated, understood and documented so that we can then have a clear policy and a decision making process, which will always be a guide. And I think it is also definitely very helpful to have um, ethics committees in our institutions because they are very useful when it comes to um, resolving such issues. If we can go to the next slide for me, please. So collections are irreplaceable, valuable, and the DSI sees them as an, a research infrastructure. So the staff that is employed to care for them must have this as their highest uh, priority. Um, if you lose your collection because you are trying to hurry to get your research paper finished and you let the collection dry out, what happens is there will no longer be a collection for you to conduct research on. But if you had to weigh between saving your collection that is drying out and finishing up that publication that you have and you need to get out of the way. You can always ask for an extension or you can always uh, reapply and start the whole process of uh, submitting your research paper. But if you choose to neglect the collection so that you just get the research paper out of the way and then you come back, probably you might not be able to uh, revive the collection and once it's gone, it's gone, unlike that research paper. And so one always have to make a decision. And like the poll has shown us earlier, it is not always a very clear cut. However, the ICOM code of ethics that Fulu referred to at the beginning, which was used to develop this chapter, says that collections must have the highest priority. So research and administration can wait while we take care of the collection and the collection care will not always be able to wait. Um, it is often very challenging and we all know that there is insufficient stuff. There is sometimes issue regarding to the budget to look after the collections. And we have inappropriate buildings holding these collections and we are not always able to have the suitable environmental conditions. We also have issues with the storage facilities. So it's a lot. And I know this, uh, as you are hearing me say this, you also know because you are based in the institution and you know exactly the situations of your institutions. But there are still examples of individuals who have taken care of collection despite all the circumstances that I've mentioned about. I have seen people beg and borrow and bleed and try to communicate their problem just to ensure that the collection was put first or the collection was taken care of before other things. So it can be a difficult thing to also report or try to raise because 
it might have implications for colleagues, your manager, or even the person who is trying to um, report the problem. But we have to think about the impact of the collection. What are the impacts of doing nothing and not reporting? Eventually, we are going to lose the collection. And if we have no specimens to conduct research on and we lose the information and the knowledge associated to that collection, we ask ourselves, was it worth it to not do anything? If we can go to the next slide, please. So while we are looking after the collections, it is not to say that we should do all that we can and forget about the health of the people who are looking after the collection themselves. So the staff head should not be compromised because of collection care. Institutions must have all the, sorry, institutions should have, have an obligation to ensure that all their activities do not impinge on the health and safety of the staff even of the visitors and other collection users that will visit that particular collection. So they should have procedures for responding to various types of emergencies and have all sorts of information available for staff and whoever will be at the institution at the time because an emergency or is not going to inform you that, okay, I am going to take place at this and that time, there better be nobody. So are the staff at risk for caring for collections? Um, examples of fumigation, fire and poisons used to preserve the collections are given here. So if an institution is going to have a fumigation, that they should be communicated well in advance to allow people enough time to pick away what they need to have packed away cover up and do every little thing that is necessary for them to do in order to be prepared for that fumigation. And like I said earlier, the institution should provide procedures for responding to various types of emergencies. So staff in the institution should know what to do in case a fire starts. And staff should be trained and have equipment to um, handle hazardous material spillages. And institutions should also provide evacuation uh, procedures and have signage everywhere and information about how to exit the building in case of an emergency. And that if there is a fire, not all the fires can be put out by staff, but if it's a little enough fire that one can put out, staff should be able to use a fire extinguisher and put the fire out. So those things are the responsibilities of the institutions. And there's prob probably many more examples that you guys are sitting there thinking of. Another important thing to note, which Michelle also touched on, is the environmental impact of the, the resources that we use when we are, uh, even the collections, when we are out there collecting, even the disposal of the chemicals after we have collected our specimens. How do we discard that material? Again, institutions should have um, procedures and instructions of how to do that. And they should not just dump it outside or in the drain because it is definitely harmful to the environment. And so staff should be trained on also the correct storage and the handling of specimens as well as the uh, correct disposal of um, hazardous material that the institutions might use. If we can go to the next slide, please. Neglect or part of part or all of the collection is never acceptable. In situations where the capacity to care or store the specimens properly becomes limited, effort should be made to minimize the use of that particular material or put them in a, a position of low activity. So we are trying to take pictures of the type material so that we don't always handle the type material a lot, but we can refer to the images that we will have uh, taken to reduce the deterioration of the actual specimens and things like that or using specimens that however if it gets to a point that the specimens do get worn out 
then one has to consider things uh, like deaccessioning them and transferring them to an institution, if it's a matter of an institution not being able to care for them, transferring them to an institution that will be able to uh, care for them in terms of the space or whatever resources. But that, of course, is advised to be a last resort. Um, so, yeah. Another thing is exchanging or selling of the specimens. That is obviously not allowed. Either biological or geological collections, the institution is not supposed to sell them, even if it's for, it's with good intentions. It is strongly discouraged. So specimens should be stored and cared for according to the best practice guidelines. ICOM has suggested that the 2013 ICOM Code of Ethics for the Natural History Museums that Fulu referred to in the beginning of the webinar, those guidelines be used and adhered to as a minimum standard for best practices. I will now hand over to Chanel, who will talk us through the collection ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. So this section deals with collection ownership, who owns the collections. And the answer is not always clear cut because we distinguish between privately owned collections where all the costs, the salaries, travel to collect, consumables, cabinets and so forth are paid by the private industry and individuals. However, most permits still require that data is released to the permitting authorities and there would still be restrictions on what can be done with the specimens. Then we have state institutions, so those are the museums and science councils. And yet the state or the taxpayers pay the salaries of the staff, travel, vehicles to go on field trips with, the buildings, electricity, consumables and so forth. And even if the funds do come from the NRF or the institution's government grant, these are all still state funds. Then we have universities, which are a little bit more tricky. So for state-owned universities, um, funds do come from the state, but for others, this is always not clear cut. And these entities tend to have more autonomy. So on that point, we'd like to hear what you think. I'm going to launch a poll that will appear on your screen right now. And the question is, can an individual staff member have their own collection at home? if you work on it in the evenings and on weekends, and it has no cost to the institutions. So, launching the poll now, if you can please vote. Okay, interesting. So it's kind of split, 41% says yes. Um, you are allowed to do that. And 59% says no. So let's go see what the ICOM um, Code of Ethics says. So ICOM says that all natural his history collections held within our institution and the related information about them should be considered to be in, the, in global custodianship rather than the sole property of the institution in which such collections reside. So it's not just custodianship for South Africa, but it's for the global community. And um, they also say that members of the museum profession should not compete with the institution, either in the acquisition of objects or in any personal collecting activity, which then leads us here. Yeah. So that is what ICON says, because you are working for the state, um, you should not be doing that. They also say that um, ICOM actively encourages the free flow of knowledge and a minimum of restrictions while safeguarding the collection objects and natural population. Commercial interests should not prevent access to scientific data sets or binary research. 
especially when their conservation is at stake. So I think it is quite clear cut. And that then also leads us to the next question, which, which deals with access to collections and data. And yeah, often government structures think that data should be sold or researchers using a collection should be charged or these should be, there should be a service in here. The reality is that revenue generated will be very small and the reputational damage to the institution will be immense. Museums have a particular responsibility for making collections and all relevant information available as freely as possible. Of course, taking into account restraints due to confidentiality and security. So access should be fair, equal, and follow a clearly defined authorization process that ensures that there's no conflict of interest or discrimination in these decision makers. This is why each institution must have a clear and documented process for decision making and authorization relating to requests for access to collections. This will prevent situations where individuals make biased decisions about who can obtain access to particular data and specimens to protect their own interests. And for further guidance on this, you can go have a look at chapter six of the manual, We you will find the NSF access policy and they are guidelines for access. And we've also developed an appeals process. So it does give you guidelines, guidelines on um, establishing an appeals committee or a process in your institution. And then um, when that fails, then that can be brought to the NSCF to deliberate the matter. Okay, at this point, I'm giving over to Michelle again. So Chanel was talking about access to the collections, but uh, most of the time the access to those collections is related to research. So somebody wants to do research on them or they want the data to do research with. So this is also what ICOM expects, and I think it's, it's a global expectation. Researchers must publish to advance research and scholarship and not to advance just their own career. So we hear about this quite often, wasteful, and where publications are sort of duplicated. So wasteful would be where you split a paper that could be could include five species, you split it into five different papers, or where you use the same set of data and you answer very closely related questions. And your aim there is to get as many papers as possible, not to contribute to knowledge generation. That's unethical to do that. Um, and it's not, we're not only talking about collection based researchers, but also when um, external researchers ask to um, have destructive sampling of collection objects, you then have to look quite carefully at what they're doing and are they um, really doing good research. The principles of honesty, integrity, objectivity, carefulness, respect for confidentiality, respect for intellectual property and copyright. So this is where we're talking about plagiarism and collaboration. So work together rather than compete against other people in the same field. And then also competency. So if you're gonna do something, do you actually have the necessary skills and knowledge to be able to do it? Um, and these are really essential principles or values for collection-based staff and researchers. Next slide, Chanel. Okay, so this came up in the last, when we were talking about private collections, and it's interesting, it's so split. And somebody, I think it was Loretta, raised the issue of a conflict of interest. And this is where you, um, where a decision you make is tainted by personal gain or favoritism. So if you've got your own collection that you build up at home, and you're also responsible for building a collection at work, 
you're going to make decisions that are tainted by your own personal gain. So when you find the most amazing specimen, you're going to be torn. And it might be on a Saturday morning. So you'll think, okay, it's Saturday. I'm going to put it in my own collection. If you didn't have that own collection, that specimen would go into the state collection where it would be accessible to everybody. So you can see, I mean, you don't get situations where a lawyer will work for a legal company in the week and on weekends have his own private company that he does on the sideline. He may do um, free work, but to generate income. So that's a conflict. That's why. So it's very, very difficult. And I think um, for staff who work in collections, they should not have private collections. Um, so there are private collections that are, you know, they, the Lepidoptera guys are amazing. They've built up these collections and they're incredible, but they're not employed as um, collection staff. So can you think of any other conflict of interest in your area of work? So post that in the chat box. So let's see some other examples of where you've seen conflict of interest, where you've suffered from conflict of interest. Reviewing papers by other people doing the same or similar kinds of work. So, yeah, so I mean, you get asked to review a paper because you're a specialist in a particular area, but sometimes people see the author of that paper as being competition and they can be overly harsh. So, so when you're reviewing papers, it, it, you have to think about, am I conflicted? Is this a conflict of interest or can I actually assess it fairly? So, so the whole um, area of work around uh, <laughs> marry, marrying the organization secretary for the benefit of being the first to receive stationery. Well done, Levy. <laughs> you might pay a big price for that conflict of interest. But yeah, so some people get special favors. Um, yeah. Ruth um, Bernard is saying conflict of interest with reviewers is a scourge of the peer review system. I also think so. And um, journals that have uh, anonymous uh, reviewers and authors, I think, is a good system. Yeah, so sometimes it feels like you have to marry the secretary to get first access to stationery. Okay, so there's lots of examples of conflict of interest, and it's important to always just think, am I conflicted? Um, and if I'm conflicted, let me rather say I'm conflicted rather than keep it hidden and then be found later to have been conflicted. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'll hand over to Fulu here for one that's a little bit different to what we normally think of. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so in terms of social justice and decolonization, um, is this relevant to the natural scientists? So I would say that if you are a human being who is interacting with other human beings in your work, in your natural sciences, that means that this is relevant to you. Um, there are many collections that are a result of work that's, that was done by unnamed people like preparators, skinners, and field attend assistants. And um, just a good example that I thought of that um, I was really excited to see when I first saw it was the um, uh, Ditsong Unsung Heroes exhibition which really celebrates the people behind the, um, the collections. Um, that's a good example of decolonizing the collections. So um, that was a good one. Collection objects um, taken from tribal land without permission from a chief 
and without communication with the people who lived or owned the land. You can't just go into a space where there are people living in that space and just because you feel that you have a permit and the, the permit is not from the chief so you feel that you have the right to just go in there without um, giving the proper respect to people that are uh, habiting that land that is not um, social justice that is um, that's a kind of colonization by itself. So there's no respect there of those people and um, that shouldn't be encouraged. Access to museums and to jobs as scientists. This is one area that is limited to the minority and this has to change. This is another aspect where there has to be this decolonization, there has to be social justice, there has to be fairness, um, and we still have a long way to go. All this has changed since 1994, but has it really changed? Um, we still see a lot of gaps. Do we all treat each other with respect and dignity that we all deserve? Is there elitism? Is there abuse of power? Is there discrimination? So if individually we can look at the situations that we're in, maybe uh, first personally in your space, in your, um, in your work environment, in, in the entire network, if you can sit and just reflect on where we are currently in terms of this and be honest about it, that's when we can start uh, making some change with regards to this. So we need some, some morals, we need some ethics, we need um, some values, we need um, no hypocrisy, we need all those positive energy and actions to start getting into our workspace and then we'll start to change. Next slide. How do we ensure an ethical behavior in our collections and institutions? Firstly, we need to determine, do you have an ethics policy in your institution? Is there anything in that policy about collections? Um, do you have a code, a code of conduct for staff? If you do have one, are ethical issues covered in that? Are collections and, re and research covered in that? And a policy or an ethics policy should not, doesn't have to be a huge document that is scary to get to do or to review. It can be a one pager. It can just be high level rules and principles that guide behavior and decision making. So you don't have to see it as something um, that is too high for you to do. It, you, it can be done and um, you can start after this webinar. Next slide. So a call to action, um, how do we ensure ethical behavior in our collections? First, does your institution have an ethics policy? Does it cover all the points that we highlighted in the manual and that are highlighted by ICOM? Um, what does it say about an ethics policy, an ethics um, committee? Um, do you have an ethics policy? Uh, I kept saying policy and ethics committee. Does it say, what does it say about intellectual property? These are all the things that you need to consider when you are either creating or um, making that ethics policy or when you are reviewing the one that your institution already has. Uh, discussing the ethics policy, reviewing existing ones or developing one from scratch will all 
help improve ethical behavior. So our call to action today is for you to first find out if you have an ethics policy. If you do, review it. If you don't, develop one. And um, you will need other people to help you or you can do it individually, whatever is your situation. Um, this is us saying, find your voice and start making the change in your own institution. For any um, manual and course related information, um, you can always visit our website, even all the, um, all the videos and every content will be shared there. Um, so I'm just going to hand over back to Michelle, who's going to take us through the first assignment for the course, uh, for the collection management course. This is for those that have registered. Okay. All right. So I'm not going to go through it in a lot of detail. We will send this to everybody, but I just wanted um, the, even the people who are not registered for the course to see what we're asking um, the course participants to do. So their assignment is going to be to go and have a look. Is there an ethics policy? If there is, compare it to the, what's said in the manual in the ethics chapter. Are there gaps? And what would we need to, be, to, to add for it to be in line with the manual? If there's no ethics policy, then you've got a draft one covering the main points that are in the manual. And policies don't have to be long. It can be one page. It doesn't have to be a long-winded thing. It should just be points, you know, um, the kind of rules, the ethical rules that you would operate under. And then also to think about it. So a lot of the issues we've discussed this morning are quite controversial. So if you, often people will push back against them. So if you've now revised, you're proposing revising the, the policy or making a new one, what do you think, which points will get the most resistance from managers? from researchers and from collection managers or collection curation staff. So each one of those groups will probably kick back about certain points. And then also it's, it's fine to just do so to draft a policy, but how would you actually go about getting that policy adopted and approved through your institution? In our institution, something like that would... <laughs> have to go through, I don't know how many hoops of fire and flames and, but there would, there is a process. And so think about how would we actually get that implemented? So that's going to be the assignment and we will um, make that accessible to everybody, but I just thought we'll uh, show it to everybody. All right, uh, let's go on to the question and answers now. So there were some very interesting uh, questions that were coming up in the chat box. Um, so the issue about the private collections did raise lots of questions. Um, let me go all the way. So the whole way, there were very interesting questions. I think um, as somebody got the quick access to them there. Let me just go. Yeah, Rachel, to read them, Michelle? No, it's okay. I'm going to, oh, all right, go. Uh, so the first one was from Matabara and he was saying, my question is on environmental impact in particular on disposal on chemicals such as used ethanol. Currently we do not have any plan for this and we have been storing the used ethanol because the easiest disposal is unethical. So he's asking how are other institutions doing on this issue? Any suggestions? Mm. So there will be other people who can help. Um, and I suggest so that, um, you know, if other people can send Matabara a message explaining how they do it. And the issue is that it's expensive. You have to have a company that will come and remove it. And that costs money and you have to go through a procurement process. So good question, Matabara. All right. But I think other people will be able to give him some advice. Maybe the Durban people, Durban Natural Science Museum people. Right, Chanel. Okay, then we have a question from Swandile. So he's asking a question about privately owned collections. 
Can they also learn specimens from institutions? He's asking this because at times it becomes challenging with low and Greek calls as people change jobs um, or they retire or they pass away or they even lose the specimens. And he's saying, I'm trying to think how challenging it could be to track and trace the owner of the private collections. Yeah. Oh, remember the big debates, Audrey, when the working group was putting the manual together about can we send the loan to a private house? And there were such big debates and arguments about this. Um, and so I think the answer isn't that generally you won't actually give a loan to a private collection or even a private individual at home, but there may be exceptions where somebody has a lot of credibility, um, but you'd have to think very carefully about it. And then Helen is saying, um, again, uh, the, or regarding donations of old private collections, if the collector didn't have any permits. Uh, this may represent material that has been collected over many years, so the records are of great value. It seems such a waste of years of valuable material if we can't accept such material. It is unethical to waste the knowledge associated with old material in such collections. Is there a way around this? Um, allowing retrospective permitting for a period, what is the way forward? Mm. This is also something that we've had lots of discussion on. And um, so if it's historical and it's old, there often weren't permit requirements and then you can accept it. But um, the, the thing may be to always just get a, a, an approval from the permitting authority, so from the province, just to say we want to accept this doesn't have permits, um, a lot of it's historical, because there may also be tops. If there's top species in there, it's a little bit different. Um, so it's not a not an easy thing, but, but I think you always have to, in this kind of situation, it is like thinking about what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do. That material wasn't really illegally collected. It wasn't collected um, th that disregarded the law. The law at the time may not have been the same as it is now. And like you say, you know, you weigh up the benefit of taking it versus the, the kind of negative aspects of it being collected without a permit. But if somebody in the last year has gone out and collected a whole lot of material without permits, it's a different matter when they want to donate. So yeah, it's, a, it's always thinking through the both sides of it, the benefit, the cost, circumstances, the intention, like being a judge. <laughs> but it's good to have a policy on this. All right, next. Then we had Sama. So she said, um, with regards to accepting road kills as donations, there's still a gray area, especially the road tools donated by the general public who know that they are a museum. We've been accepting road tools before and now we have to turn them away because they don't have collecting permits to collect that specimen. Can this point be discussed or clarified in this webinar? So I see Audrey did respond and she said, um, the person donating the road tool should be the owner of the land where the animal was killed. But if not, then legislation says we should leave it. Yeah, so um, so the bigger issue is the Section 20, the Animal Disease Control Act. And when we met with the people from the Department of Agriculture, so that unit, and we asked them about this, they just said flat out, you can't accept it because it hasn't got the Section 20. And we try to explain, um, so we'll carry on um, engaging with them, but um, yeah, you don't know what disease is. If somebody finds a rat in their swimming pool and picks it up and brings it to you, you actually don't know what diseases that thing has got. Um, so it's still a lot of discussion and negotiation and clarity. And yeah, these are practices that people have always done. We've always accepted you know, roadkill and things that have drowned or been caught by dogs or whatever. And it may be changing now. Okay. Yeah, 
on mute. Mzwandile had a, had a follow-up question on his um, sending lo loans to privately owned collections. Saying, he's saying, um, are there guidelines that will ensure that exception given will not lead to favoring others while some might be deprived? Uh, Audrey, do you want to answer that? Yes, they are in the manual. Remember when we went to lockdown, we really reconsidered the statement of not allowing people to keep um, loans in their private homes as long as they can prove that they have one, two, three in place and they can do all the things that we list there. So those are the guidelines in Zondile should uh, find in the manual. They're in appendix in the manual. Um, there was another question from Roger. He said, if stolen uh, specimens are confiscated by law enforcement officers, what is supposed to happen to them? Should they not be put into national collections? Is there a protocol for this? I don't think that we've ever really thought this through. I don't remember. I don't know if Audrey remembers. Um, but, you know, we should, act, I agree, we should accept um, material from law enforcement and from prosecutions. But then it's different to accepting something that, um, you know, the, the, the police are acting in their role, in their official role when they confiscate it. We should get them to deposit dead things with us. Um, but it's different accepting something from the person who broke the law by getting it but i know so i know with 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 the botanical gardens here and with the zoo um confiscated plants and animals are brought to sandy and put in the zoo or um put here in the gardens and we have to look after them and so it should be the same for dead things i think they should come to the to the institution so it might be something we need to look at Okay. Um, then Nkepeni was saying, we identify and accept invasive plants with fruit. How can we safely dispose of what we cannot incorporate in our collection so as not to cause more invasions? Yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, it is something that I think we don't often think about enough when we finished with something and we toss it into the, <laughs> into the rubbish. Do you know what seeds you're spreading or what microbes are attached to plants? So I don't know about if the plant people have um, a way of um, disposing of um, alien seeds. So how would you make sure that those seeds aren't going to be viable? I don't so know. Chris, no, Christina is saying microwave the seeds before discarding. Ah, there we go. There we go. I can remember when I worked at the museum in KZN, I had those giant hissing cockroaches that were illegal, so I'll admit. Somebody brought them from Canada for, for me and gave them to me to rear for the museum's exhibits. And I think I had six of them with no permits and they started breeding like crazy. They're live breeders, they have live babies. And the next thing, the tanks were crawling with Madagascar and baby cockroaches. And I had to, I had to do sculling and I had to dispose of them and, and think very carefully about, I mean, there was no way I could just toss that stuff in the garbage. Otherwise we would have all been overrun with giant hissing Madagascan cockroaches. I don't think we would have, but you know, when you throw anything out, you've got to think very carefully about what might survive and get out there. Thanks, Christina, for that suggestion. That sounds reasonable. All right, anything else? Um, Lee made a comment. So she said, if the institution is registered at Section 20 facility and it has undergone an audit and can verify that the storage of the specimen is in line with Section, section 20 guidelines, then this activity may be permissible. I don't know what activity she's talking about. The rope. 
talking about the roadkill and accepting the roadkill, and this was also so. Yeah, we're really struggling with the Section Twenty permits and the department being quite unreasonable about what they um requiring. So in that case, even if the institution is is completely certified and checked and everything is fine, every time you go out and collect an animal, you need a Section Twenty permit. To collect it, even if your facility is certified. Um, and so, what they were saying is that you know, for, for picking up a roadkill, you need a Section Twenty permit. Because the person who, so maybe the people who, um, if you start from the museum, it might be fine. But if you're a member of the public, did you follow the right procedures when you picked it, scooped it up off the road, put it in the back of your car, and drove it and handled it? You know. So, so over the, you know, for the over the next year or so, we're going to have to try and get more clarity. I mean, with the biobanks, the biodiversity biobanks, the Section Twenty permits are are crippling the work, and so we need further engagement. So a lot of these questions will be discussed with the department. Yeah. Um, there are four people who have raised their hands. I'm not sure if they have questions or it was um, okay. So we have Derek. We have Derek and Galaxy. Okay. Derek, please go ahead and ask your question. Oh, it says it was 30 actions earlier. Okay. Uh, okay. Must be the same for the others also. Right. Okay, anybody else? Fulu, um, did I miss anything in the Q&A? Um, I see there's a new one from Lee. Yeah, so she's just saying this will obviously differ based on what type of specimens and what conditions. So not the definitive answer. Yeah, yeah, there isn't one complete answer. Okay, so there were lots of interesting um, points in the in the chat about the alcohol, the ethanol, the seeds. Um, yeah. Okay, so some very good, very useful sharing of, of information there. All right. And then uh, I see Mzwan Bile saying he asked another question. So he's saying, what are the safety protocols in forests having specimens at home? Do, do they also have fume cupboards, ventilators, and so forth? Should be the, should there be a fire who is going to be held uh, liable? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Audrey, what were the um, minimum requirements that we said for people having specimens at home? Can you remember? Yes, and it's not everything that will obviously be available in the museum. So what we suggested was that as long as they can keep them safe and limit um, and restrict movement in that room and not... Uh, let other people at home have access and we did not cover the health and safety aspect. If you, you don't have a fire extinguisher in your home, you don't have and it is very unlikely that because you want to loan material, you are going to have one installed before you get the loan material. But we hope people can make, uh, can take care of their collections they can while the collection is in their home. Yeah, so so we might need to think um, about that carefully, and because um, that is a good point. So, when you're sending material on loan to somebody's home, to have a liability waiver, to, so to say that the institution, so to say these specimens are flammable, um, and in the case of a fire, the institution can't be held liable for any damage. That's something we haven't really um, talked about that, but it is a good point. 
Yeah. But yeah, you will lose your specimens. Um, the institution can't, um, it would be very difficult to hold a private person liable for the loss of specimens if you allow them to go there, knowing that they didn't have fume cupboards and fire suppression systems in their home and you allowed them, then you would you wouldn't be able to hold the, the private person liable for that loss. All right. So lots of very interesting discussion here. Um, sorry, Audrey, did you want to say add anything about the home, private home? Um Maybe important to note that we initially were very much against the lending, even if it's not to a home, if it was a private institution, which I think is why Mzandule was raising the question. But in the July working group meeting, as we were going through lockdown, we realized that we didn't know how long it could go on. And we thought the idea of people being stuck at home and not being able to do anything when it could be an option to get the collections and, and continue working at home if you are able to. And we discussed it thoroughly and we eventually agreed to have that addendum to say, well, people can, uh, extreme uh, or critical uh, cases can take uh, the collections to their private homes and yeah. So it was, it was not thoroughly scrutinized. And I don't remember that we do have um, something saying that they are flammable and should something happen while they're in your possession, which is something you definitely need to have included in the manual. Um, thanks, Audrey. So, I mean, we are going to be, um, we are going to be updating the manual maybe in about three years time. And one of Audrey's um, responsibilities is to kind of collect and coordinate all these suggestions and, and issues with the manual. And so this might be something that we need to add um, so that when we get to, to do the revision of the manual, we've got all the input that's come in from these sessions or from working groups or from anything. All right. Anything else, you know? No. <laughs> that I can so, see. Yeah, about the dead things. I know. Um, it's a yeah, it's a huge challenge. Um, but but currently, I mean, we we've got to try and work within the law. The law is a lot. Um, more clear cuts. So currently the law says that you can't accept those things at roadkill that the, at a private person brings it in. And until we can get the department to understand, but I don't think that they will, they're not going to, you know, um, I was listening to the radio this morning on my way to work. They were talking about COVID and the origins of COVID and it was probably from a bat that was transferred to a pangolin and got to people. And now, and, and it was um, Professor Karim and he said, you know, animals are full of viruses. <laughs> They're full of, uh, full of disease and we're going to keep being exposed to those different kinds of diseases. So this isn't the end of it. Now you're asking the government department who's responsible to give you permission to be able to pick up things off the side of the road and carry them and handle them and give them to people at the museum who work with them, you know? And so you can understand the fear of people now. Um, and why, why it's going to be hard for us to, to say, don't worry, it's, it's fine. If people pick up dead animals on the street, on the road, in the swimming pool, it's fine for them to handle it and bring it to us. And you see why people are going to be even more paranoid now. 
So even if it does seem silly and unreasonable, I think when people bring, when the public bring specimens in, you can use this covered to explain to them and to explain to them the law. I mean, look at the chicken thing, <laughs> another thing. So our chickens, we can't export our chickens at the moment because of it's an avian flu strain, David Allen might know more. But again, if you find dead birds, they carry this, they carry diseases, you can transmit, you can destroy the chicken industry. So, <laughs> yeah, so we've got to be, we've got to be ethical, we've got to be really responsible about what we do, even though we've been doing it in a different way before. All right. Also very interesting suggestions about killing those seeds. Okay. Uh, and Lee has said, yeah, that was Lee. Yeah, so she's also got a section. So she's going, going she said she, that, so the Durban Museum is going to, to be having a whole big section 20 audit and we'll be able to learn from them and maybe um, influence them a little bit about being more reasonable um, while being careful at the same time. Okay, I think if there's nothing else, let's um, end off. We've gone over time, but I think there was just so many, there were so many interesting um, questions and um, discussion. It was really very interesting. And I think it's, it's a very important topic. We are going to be having the discussion forum next week. So there'll be more opportunity to engage in the issue of ethics in collections. Um, I think we're gonna have, I think we've got four panel members who will be talking about different areas of ethics in their collections. And there'll be more opportunity to, for people to ask questions and to discuss. And so you've got a week, you can also reflect, think through what we covered today, some of the questions, things that you might still want to ask. Um, so yeah, just to end, I'd like to thank the panel members um, and Fulu and for all the marketing she does to give everybody the information they need and setting up the registration and everything. And Chanel who drives the whole process of the webinar and then of course to everybody who's here thank you very much for all these interesting comments and questions and for being part of this so thank you